Um, I'm Jay Amovig, and uh, I co-host the Marissa uh, Marissa Hyde. Marissa? Oh, yeah. Marissa. Marissa. All right, yeah, and she's gonna go first. So, um, without further ado, Marissa Hyde. Sweater of soul, 
striped with liquor dipped ribbons, coated in fine golden glitter against the wool pearls. The breath of Sunday was once salt crystals forming, gods descending, the broken air of too much smoke. It looked the way black coffee tastes, as warm and uninviting as a stranger's car, though no objection is held. Now a night begging for off-season flowers weaved into braids and champagne stuck there bursts before the stage darkens. Conversation dull around me, the only sound a laughing hum. Three. I didn't find the gun, but I searched my brain for where you might hide those things. There is nothing locked in that house, nowhere to stow away secret pieces. Somewhere between what was and what will be, 
Echoes of yesterday run through my mind, planting seeds of tomorrow, clouding my empathy. I walked away because love was mine. So used to a world of uphill climbing, I walked away love left behind, caught up in a world of never finding. The smell of barbecue on a street in May, she wondered why she wasn't welcome to stay. The lights danced in the sky on the 4th of July, high above fear and envy in a young child's eye. A door unanswered, a party uninvited, a close friend made and lost, a young girl still undecided. Winters turned to springs and springs to summers, she held her innocence at her side. No song unsung, no dream to die, her world was naked, no need to hide. So she loved a boy for the look in his eye, his spring and his step, and the way his smile fell to one side. She'd happily watch as the rest of the world passed them by. So they dreamed and they cried, and they laughed and they played, and she still held on when he walked away. A love unreturned, a heart uninvited, a good friend made and lost, a young woman now divided. Winters turned to springs and springs to summers, he took her innocence in his stride. The story was told, the dream had died. The world was tainted and her hands were tied. So she loved a man for the sweet nothings he spun, the warmth of his touch, and the way he'd say she'd always be the only one. She knew it was over before it had ever begun. She never knew of trust in any love. She wanted him to share the doubt. Believing she could never have love, she forced him to go without. Standing on the edge of time, Somewhere between what was and what will be, echoes of yesterday run through my mind, planting seeds for tomorrow, out of my empathy. I walked away because love was mine. Thank you. Um, before I go on, I just want to make sure that I should. I know someone's sick. Is everything okay? I feel kind of bad. You're okay? Okay. I felt kind of bad reading while you're coughing. I wasn't sure if I should stop. Because your poetry took a rough yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Um, a goodbye in August. A phantom for daylight, cat in the night, outside vacant, inside fright. A late summer stroll from the demons she fought, trailing behind her all she sows, all she sought. A tale to mend, a meaning to find, the world subject to only her mind. A late summer's cry for what it may be worth, falling like raindrops in a death in an earth. A smile and hello, sweet sorrow says goodbye. How be so low what once was so high? A late summer's wonder, a good look inside. Familiarity and contempt may walk side by side. A cold sweat, a warm embrace, forced to compare she denied to face. <coughs> a late summer's decision was in our hands. Long mold over, we won't understand. A late summer's resolve to change our lives. A friend forever, a lover once a
Somewhere between the past and pending, all your dreams of truth descending. The link between the lost and the liable is often blurred by the indescribable. Somewhere between yesterday's blind child and tomorrow's reflection, all your past innocence is a mere recollection. The change from the existent to the expired often lies in a mind uninspired. Sometimes I wish we had saved that $75. There are tons of $70 surgeries that we could really use right now. New religions and creative governments desperately need every penny. Color TV would fucking rule. But I guess we shouldn't feel too bad. When I consider how long I was in nothing, before we got married on a train, found out that love doesn't even conquer fractions, and discovered that you had been in nothing the entire time too, I wouldn't trade our 15 minutes for anything. We should find someone to take care of our cats and chickens and head out that way soon. Have you seen the stuff that's been taking over our living room or kitchen? Jesus, I don't even remember the people we killed to get those novelty alarm clocks. The flea market, I'm telling you, we could be icons of the long night with the eerie light pollution one more time. Or even two more times. If your building is greedy for loving quarters, that's what you have, that's what you have, as I've been feeling lately. Thank you. This is Yes. Just the um, last No, no, I just, it's already been off to a good start. The first two people were in, I was like, shit. <laughs> oh, man, I have to suck glass. It's a challenge. It's not the thing that um, All right, so this is uh, the other book of mine that came out this year through Alien Buddha Press. And the other book is from Iran Press, I meant to say, too. But this is from Alien Buddha Press, and it's called The Ludicrous Split. It's a split chapbook I did with the remarkable poet, Kevin Ridgway, lives out in uh, Long Beach. Um, definitely check out his work. He's one of the best poets I've ever had the pleasure of knowing or reading. And my contribution was, uh, in December 2016, I did a poem a day challenge with my friend, Alicia Holmes. It was yet another good writer that you should check out. But uh, we were doing the thing where we each had to do a poem every day. And uh, which feels a lot like homework, but it was still fun. And it was particularly fun because it was in December 2016. So it was the month after the election. 
And there were a lot of feelings about, <laughs> well, there might be those feelings I mentioned at the top of the you know? Just feelings, though, like, holy shit. You know, my wife sometimes says to me, you know, you drink, I just, why, don't, why can't you drink less like you did before? I'm like, you know, I just <laughs> yeah, anybody who laughs, they get it. Trust me. Um, this was written on December 9th, and it's called There Was a Video Store 2. Three pro lifers walk into a hot dog eating contest in Canada Falls, Wisconsin. And I forget the rest of what may or may not be a joke, because when the Southwest's largest neon cactus exploded on that one stupid night in 1992, I learned to let go of a lot of things. Let's just say those motherfuckers died. And let's just say the deep green light that made up that cactus are still inspiring riders at the nearby grocery store to this very day. Let's call it a night, then a year, and then a decade. If it could be left up to me, I would honestly be thrilled to fucking bits if I didn't have to keep remembering openers, but never the goddamn punchline. I'd like content. I'd be content if I could forget everything and anything, as it may or may not have happened.
Not as awful as a honeymoon. If what you really want is a way out, fuck the barrel. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Take the fall naked, lying down, feet first, arms open wide like a bloody messiah, unable to bear the burdens of its doubters. Go overboard and see how the rocks treat you. So it begins like this, waiting too long for a lazy train out of West Toledo. On the concrete platform, couples embrace, preparing to go their separate ways, pretending next time they meet they will pull out a map and choose a place, Ann Arbor or Los Angeles or Atlantic City, and that's where they'll belong, where they'll build a life and live happy forever. Like Shrek and Fiona or sharks or birthday party magic they no longer believe in. And why should they? The train hasn't left yet but they both look eagerly towards the tracks, anticipating its departure. This is the same story. Our house is big, red brick with off-white walls that watched over us while we slept, while we prayed for our souls to be kept. While we shared bath, water, and bunk beds in the secret of the back closet we will die with and never reveal. Paradise, 1987. Cows and cornstalk and cornstalks and Phillies baseball. Cow shit and dry feed corn and Mike Schmidt, more specifically. If you really feel like bothering us with the goddamn specifics. 1987. Iran Contra and the Cold War and Reaganomics. Everything was overpriced but baseball cards and penny candy in our house because it sat too close to a chicken hatchery which only means something if you've been to a chicken hatchery. At night, hundreds of baby chicks are disposed of in a big blue dumpster, and the lid is closed until they suffocate together and die and wet rot like infected mucus. And you smell them decomposing through your bedroom window, and their desperate, unorganized chirps give you nightmares until you burn down a different hatchery in a different town 12 years later, and you try explaining it all to the district court judge, but he doesn't care or doesn't understand for the last defendant just told him the same fucking story. This is called whole. It's always the eyes that betray, crying or fucking or baking chicken for a family that stop feigning concern, while the dead cat rests comfortably on a couch cushion in a forgotten corner of the basement where wine was once stored. We used to read books and play board games and watch home movies, but now the cat's dead and he won't give us our space back. We're not really sure what to do with him now. A blanket maybe, or a garbage bag, or a hole in the backyard beside the busted bicycle frames and the bruised tomatoes we picked and discarded after the bugs took their turns. A strange girl sobs in an attempt at dignity that no one else wants, but we watch her tears and play some music and eat the chicken that came out dry even with barbecue sauce. We eat in silence while the girl dries her eyes and takes off her sweater and closes the cat's eyes before kissing them. She puts the sweater over the cat's body and asks us to hold hands, and we do. And we want to because it's been a while, and we know that if the cat had nine lives, we still laid him up. And his eyes were a shade of yellow we all love. And that's something, isn't it? A bond or a lifetime of moments we all stopped sharing so long ago we forgot why. After dinner, we walk for ice cream and smile for a few minutes. And it feels good, and the cat is in the trash can when we come back. And the strange girl is gone, and none, none, blah, blah, and none of us ever want to stop feeling good. big with cream colored walls and impractical rooms crammed with sofas and empty bookshelves and countertops lined with ceramic Siamese kittens. We used to play hide and seek with the little girl who lived there and the broken tub in the upstairs bathroom was always home base. One day in one of the bedrooms, the one with ruffled gold curtains and famous photos of the town after the big flood, we found her grandmother hanging by a thick rope from a ceiling rafter. The newspaper said she did it because that's what her mother did and her mother's mother, and her mother's mother's mother before that, all the way back to 1846 when her great-great-grandmother was forced into the noose by a bounty hunter for aiding the Underground Railroad. The only part of the story we believe is the part we witnessed firsthand, the old lady hanging there limp in a lit, light gray nightgown, dead blue skin and no panties. We touched her dead legs and dead feet and thought about telling somebody, but we didn't. We closed the door and found somewhere else to hide. 
inside a closet or between the bookshelves behind the stack of boxes labeled an antique. Thanks. pierce my flesh, a hook. I swim away in fear, in fright, but it is no use. I cannot escape. Yanked, my body pulled towards the surface, then out, into the sky. I cannot breathe. I try to scream, but I cannot. I'm pulled towards two men, one big, one small. They smile and laugh. Isn't this fun? The father says to his son. It's the last thing I hear as I suffer. Morals on Monday. Meatless Mondays, for those of us who don't want animals to suffer every day. I mean, I care, but not on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, the weekend. But one day a week, I can do something better. I won't pay for their suffering on Monday. I'm already hating the alarm clock, the official end of my weekend that brought me back to my nine to five. I guess I can eat a bean burrito today. Not tomorrow, that's asking too much. I can't be expected to care two days in a row. Hold on, while only causing suffering six days a week is certainly better than seven, when did our morals have breaks, optional days? If our boss exhibited sexist attitudes, would we encourage him to stop being sexist on Thursdays? Since we know not being sexist every day would be too sudden a change for him. Are we against family separation on the weekends? Do we impose rape on Fridays? Do we shun racism every other Tuesday? Is pedophilia intolerable the first Sunday of the month? If we deem something wrong, how can it be wrong only some of the time? Is convenience a justification for our morals? Do we really only have the willpower for 14.3% follow through on our values? Years. We're going to shift gears slightly here in the next couple. Next one's the shortest poem, one stanza here. It's called Failed Poetry. I try to write a poem expressing my views on current politics, but I only end up plagiarizing Robert De Niro. <laughs> this one's called Too Busy with Excuses. Disgusted with violence, with thoughts and prayers, it's their only protection. Students walk out. Shut up, they are told. Sit in class. You're in a democracy, but don't participate. Gun control won't help, you stupid liberal. People will still get guns, just like they get heroin. 
but I noticed legalizing heroin wasn't in your game plan. The Second Amendment gives me the right to my AR-15. Does it give you the right to a tag, a rocket launcher, a hand grenade, a missile, a nuclear bomb? Don't we already agree that it is not a blanket right for civilians to own any weapon they desire? The Second Amendment is in the Constitution, though they don't seem fond of the first right now. You can't change the Second Amendment. You know, uh, amendments. The changes were made in the Constitution. Yeah, you can't change the changes, apparently. When we tell students not to use their voice, we are encouraging apathy. When we tell people nothing can change, we are ignoring history. This country is encouraging hate. We are empowering racist thoughts. We are perpetuating toxic masculinity. We are profiting from greed. We are breeding fear. And then we are arming a scared, hateful population with weapons meant to rapidly kill numerous people. And then yes, we are dying. But sit back down, students. We are too busy with excuses to make any changes. our definition of love. Can we, as I often hear, both love and eat an animal? Can we cherish a horse before we gobble her up? Would we call that love? Can we admire the grace of a dolphin or the strength of an elephant before turning him into stew? Would we call that love? Oh, my sweet, adorable poodle, how I loved you until I got hungry and heated the barbecue. <laughs> Actually, um, and this is examining the idea we all have a line. It's called you have a line. We all have this line, not just vegans, of animals we won't eat. I'm fairly certain no one in this room is open to all 5,000 plus mammals and 9,000 reptiles and 2 million insects out there, 10,000 birds and 27,000 fish species in the world. We all have some lines of which ones we won't eat. So this one examines that idea. And do you have a line? A line to which you draw to sort out the animal, to help you sort out sort the animal. Sort that over. Do you have a line, a line to which you draw to help you sort the animals from tiger to macaw? Who will snuggle in your bed? Who will you flatten in a trap? Who will, you, who will sit upon your plate? Who will sit upon your lap? Which ones do you cherish? Which ones get a knife? Which ones do you leave alone to just be wild? Which ones deserve protection? Which ones deserve love? Which ones simply get a blade to remove their precious blood? Which ones do you make, which ones do you cage and make jump through fiery hoops? Which ones do you cram inside tiny metal coops? Is the answer in their voices of what you will allow? Do you eat the ones who moo, but never ones who meow? Is the answer neatly packaged inside the grocery store? Is this where you will make the choice between horse and wild boar? When seated in a restaurant to have a bite to eat, is coyote on the menu in which to sink your teeth? Is the answer in the drive through supersized with fries? Is this where you will make the choice, which one lives and which one dies? How did you decide this line of life and death, choosing one another, should take their final breath? Was it carefully determined? Were your options fully weighed? Or did you simply follow the way others first behaved? Take the time to ask yourself where your line will be and whether you want to fill your plate with death and misery. If God, in his infinite wisdom, or hers, or its, or there, <coughs> gave you chickens to munch on, weren't you also given pears? but has some very similar writing, examining some of the topics, a lot of the writing and artwork that I've done inside that is on the back tables. The last one is called Just a Drink. A helpless female, held against her will, penetrated and now pregnant, held captive, no chance of escape. The baby grows for months and months inside her belly. The mother, ready to love her baby, despite her circumstances, delivers a baby boy. The baby, only longing for the comfort of his mother, the mother, only longing to be near her new son. The baby feels himself pulled away further and further until he can no longer see her ever again. The mother, helplessly watching, bellows and bellows for days and days in search of a baby who will never return. The son stands in a dark crate, malnourished, alone. Soon his pale flesh will sit on a plate, his skin no longer attached 
will cover your hands when they get cold. The milk his mother produced to nourish him and help him grow sits in your cup. Thank you very much. Walking directly in front of that camera. Uh, this is perhaps a, my favorite one so far because it's a, a name like Cher or Madonna. Um, and you never know what you're going to get. Rachel? <laughs>
It turns out not the way that serves you. My strength is a force, the first to break the cycles of generations before even you. I abandon you willingly, running triumphant to the forest. She holds me stable, her leaf brush my hair, the wind kisses my cheek, and so relieved, I release you. Walk away as you become hollow, wailing to me to save you. That was never my place, you wretched bitch, thief of all my night stars, every horse story. I abandon you with all my power, I turn away, no need to bow. I was never you, I owe gratitude to. The resilience in me flexes its wisdom, so uninhibited, free, wild, and untamed. I roar in victory the story, how I prevail, and I abandon you. Victorious is the next one.
bunch of great stuff. So check it all out.